Okay. Um, so, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this uh, world of uh, Zoom. My name is Ignacio Darnot, and I'm really grateful to the Los Angeles um, LGBT Center for allowing me the opportunity to give these uh, three art talk series. And to give you a sense of my background, I've been developing a documentary series for nearly a decade now about the impact of gay artists in history called Hiding in Plain Sight, Breaking the Gay Code in Art. And today I will be sharing in my lecture many of the extraordinary facts that I have uncovered in my research. And uh, hold on, why isn't the page number coming? Oh, here. Um, okay, so we're starting with, I wanna start with a few caveats. Um, as I'm gonna show you in a, in a quick second, um, sexuality in ancient Greece was very different from how we label homosexuality today. It's kind of interesting that the term homosexuality appeared for the very first time in German language. And um, it appeared even before the term heterosexuality. In English, the term homosexuality didn't appear until 1891. So we should be very careful when we apply this modern concept of homosexuality to any artist before modern time. And I will, I will talk about that uh, more in a second. And um, because most artists in today's lecture come from the Renaissance and the period right after where female artists were not the norm, today I'm not gonna cover any female artists in my lecture. However, uh, you're gonna see many of them in the next two uh, lectures. You're gonna hear me say a lot the term homoerotic art. What do I mean by that? My definition of it is an image that is not overtly sexual, sexual, but is very appealing to the gay viewers in a subtle or not so subtle way. And I'm gonna be showing you homoerotic art coming from both gay and heterosexual artists. You're also gonna hear me say the terms gay and uh, queer indistinctly. So, I know that for the longest time, the term queer has been used as an insult to the gay community. But I also know that in the last few years or decades even, it has been kind of reappropriated as a badge of honor um, in defiance of heteronormativity. And um, I love this definition of uh, what queer means uh, by the artist and um, filmmaker, Larry Clark. He says, Gay implies weak, fey. Queer is transgressive, audacious, unapologetic. Queer doesn't have a look, a gender. It defies boundaries. It absorbs and appreciates gay, and it doesn't care who you sleep with. So because most artists in my three lectures are gonna be coming before modern times, really, it would be much more appropriate to define them as queer than gay in the modern sense of the word. So now I'm going to my lecture. And before I do that, you don't need to read any of the um, slides because I'm gonna be incorporating that into my lecture. And if you have any questions, uh, please hold them until the end when there will be time for a Q&A. So if you do some research, you'll find out that 20 of the world's most expensive paintings have been created by queer artists. For instance, the most uh, expensive painting in history by Leonardo da Vinci, the Salvatore Mundi, that recently sold for $475 million. This image of the eight Elvises by Warhol for 120, the flag by Jasper Jones for 130 million, and then this triptych by Francis Bacon that sold for $158 million. However, if you ask people in the street, as I did in the research uh, for my documentary, if they could name any gay artists, really, I would say 90% were really hard pressed to name one or, or more than one in the, in, the, uh, in the best case. So why is this? Why is this disconnect um, in regards to, to the, 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 the awareness of uh, gay artists? Well, The main reason is that the art world and museum boards 
have always dismissed the importance of queer art and artists throughout history. For instance, we all know about Picasso's female muses and their importance in his work. However, up until very recently, and when I say very recently, I'm talking about probably this year, when you bring up the sexuality of gay artists, the response from the art world and the very conservative museum boards is usually something like, oh, that's irrelevant or kind of a don't ask, don't tell policy. The issue with this is that by dismissing the relevance of an artist's homosexuality in their creativity and the crucial impact of queer artists in history, what we're doing is we are reinforcing the stigma and the lack of visibility of the gay community. And the fact which you probably know is never taught in schools is that far from invisible, irrelevant, or just a new trend, which is what many people in the art world you know, want us to believe it is, queer art has appeared in every culture from painting to sculpture, photography, music, literature, and it crosses through all ages, genders, races, and beliefs. And here you have some examples from the Egyptians to Greek vases, to Latin American ceramics and Roman and Etruscan frescoes. Sorry, well, I'm sorry, but I'm trying to move on. There you are. So let's talk about um, ancient Greece. In ancient Greece, the relationship between an older man and adolescent boys was not only accepted, but expected as part of the young man's education. So the older man could instill in the younger man courage and honor. This changed in Rome. In Rome, these so-called pederastic relationships were no longer the norm, but because Rome was a culture that it was more uh, really driven by power and aggression, this culture really filtered down to their perception of homosexuality. So homosexuality was not illegal as long as you had the active role in the gay act. However, the passive role was uh, stigmatized. So this completely changed with the advent of Christianity in the fourth century. So when that happened, for instance, the emperor Justinian blamed homosexuality for all evils in the world, from famine, earthquakes, plagues, etc., And then the emperor Constantine established laws that imposed death penalty for male homosexual acts. Female homosexuality was not even considered. And these laws were not repealed in many countries until the late 18th century. So because homosexuality has been prosecuted since the fourth century, erotic art disappeared. And since then, gay artists have always faced a dilemma. Should I stay in the closet or should I be out with my art and my life? And in doing so, risk critical and commercial rejection and even prosecution. And believe it or not, this is still an issue. 71 countries still criminalize homosexuality today. In fact, in England, homosexuality was not decriminalized until the uh, year 1967. So even today, many artists reject the queer label because it can displace any other factor of the work. It can affect the reputation, it can affect the critics' reaction, and even the price of their work. What is extraordinary is that in spite of this repression, queer artists have revolutionized mainstream culture. They have survived scandals, won landmark battles, modernized photography, spearheaded art movements, every step of the way. And I'm gonna be sharing with you examples of all of this throughout my three lectures. And I love this quote from the author Camille Paglia about it. She says, for 2,500 years, Western culture has fed itself on the achievements of small bands of gay artists attaining visionary heights through defiance of the established code of beauty. It's a beautiful definition. And I really love, particularly I love the, the fact that she used the word code. Why is that? Because my three lectures are gonna to reveal to you 
the different codes and strategies that were used by queer artists to express their homoerotic desires during repressive times. So basically, these strategies, these codes, allow the queer artists to be visible only to those they wanted to attract without alienating others, without drawing hostile gazes from uh, non-gay people. So my first lecture, which is today, um, which I call Loving Like the Gods. In this, I talk about how queer artists all over the world and from all eras use classical, religious, and mythological images as the perfect cover-up to show beautiful male bodies. So the cover-up, the conceit, is that the male news that society seems sim deems sinful become acceptable by romanticizing these news in a classical faraway past. In next week's talk called The Double Lives of Iconic Queer Artists, I'm gonna show you how many queer artists created mainstream work, which they showed openly, as well as homoerotic work, which they either, which they either hid, destroyed, or circulated just among a circle of friends. And I'm gonna talk about how in many instances, the families of these artists destroy all evidence of their sexuality after their death to protect the reputation. And some of the artists I'm gonna be covering in my talk next week are Caravaggio, Frida Kahlo, Andy Warhol, and John Singer Sargent. And in my last uh, lecture two weeks from today, called Tricking the Eye with Coded Desires, I'm gonna show you how renowned artists created astonishing queer imagery hiding in plain sight, or they use secret codes in their art. And just like I said uh, a minute ago, and detected by the general population, these coded images allow them to express taboos in a way that is not punishable. And some of the artists that I'm gonna cover are Thomas Eakins, Grant Wood, Rosa Bonner, David Hockney, Jasper Jones, and Francis Bacon. Okay, so let's now <clears throat> get into the, the core of our talk today, which is what I call the longest cultural theme in the Western world. What do I mean by that? By that, I mean artists using classical, mythological, and religious images to express forbidden desires. So here I have an example of each of them. A classical statue, a beautiful Amazon, very erotic, a mythological image, of Diana's bath that allows Boucher to show female nudes. And this very famous statue by Bernini of the ecstasy of St. Teresa, who according to many experts, it really reveals more sexual ecstasy than religious ecstasy. So these probably het heterosexual artists use this device to show forbidden desires. So it is really not a surprise that queer artists also use classical, mythological, and religious images to express their homoerotic desires. You know, so basically, it all goes back to ancient Greeks. As I mentioned before, women didn't have a significant role in society. The greatest quality of mankind uh, was exemplified by the nude male body, and same sex desire was accepted. So because of that background, artists of all eras have used stories and images based on the Greeks as a cover-up to portray homoerotic desires. And now focusing on the classical images, here you have, so you can see that it's in all media from a painting by Basile, a photograph by Herbert Liszt, or the famous uh, Michelangelo's David. So in patriarchal societies, the male nudes as the object of the desire is very problematic. Why is that? It's because that completely turns upside down the gender hierarchy. So the male nudes, which disappeared from the fourth century since Christianity, reappear 12 centuries later during the Renaissance. How? they were legitimized by the classical alibi that romanticizes them in a classical faraway past. What is, I find fascinating 
is that this conceit still happens today. You know, museums are in many cases the only respectable gaze at, na and, at naked bodies. However, we are trained since childhood to dismiss the erotic elements of these works of art. Now I'm going to talk to you about a revolutionary uh, sculpture, Donatello's table, which uh, fits into this classical uh, 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 cover. So it was created, Donatello created it around the 1440s, and it really broke all the molds. Let me walk you through that. This is the very first freestanding male nude statue since antiquity. And it revolutionized art when transformed sculpture, which was considered up until, uh, up until then, kind of like a medieval craft, into an expression. Mm -hmm. Can, can, can pre, uh, people please uh, mute the, the microphones? Um, so when transformed the medium from a medieval craft into an expression of individual genius. So representing the David versus Goliath story, this sculpture was created by Donatello as a metaphor for the small but mighty city of Florence, which had a huge cultural importance under the Medici, in spite of being at war with very powerful enemies. But this statue is covered with very subversive queer elements, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you. So let's look at it closely. The first thing we notice is David's sensual, smooth body. He's nude with the exception of his helmet, his uh, sandals and his shin guards. He's very androgynous. If you look at him from the back, it's hard to tell if he's male or female. And um, instead of having the traditional heroic pose that you, you're familiar with in, in, in sculptures, he has the contrapposto pose in which all his weight of the body goes into one leg that is far from associated with heroism and is more associated with the, if anything, with the queer community. But there are even more queer elements in Donatello's um, sculpture. So with no biblical base for it, Donatello puts the feather in Goliath's helmet, helmet at David's um, leg, basically sensually caressing his inner thigh. So for Donatello, David is very much aware of his erotic power, not only in you, the viewer, but in Goliath. In fact, the implication is that he won the battle by seducing him. So it's hard to tell if when Donatello created this in the 1440s, this statue was considered homoerotic because it was displayed publicly in one of the Medici courtyards. However, let me contextualize it. At the time that Donatello created this uh, statue, Florence had such a reputation for its acceptance of homosexuality that in Europe, the gay sex was called the Florentine vice. So much so that to keep it, uh, homosexuality in check, the city of um, Florence established an organization called the Office of the Night, where citizens could denounce homosexuality anonymously. And just as a reference, there are staggering numbers. In a city of around 40,000 people, at least 17,000 men out of, uh, were accused at least once of homosexuality. And let me uh, remind you of something. This is all about the homosexual, the, the prosecution of homosexual acts. There is in no way, shape or form, the concept of homosexual identity yet, okay? And, um, to add an extra element of queerness to the story uh, of, of this culture, many critics believe that his face is inspired by Antinous, who was the Emperor Hadrian's young lover. So if you put all this together, no wonder this statue is considered the first uh, gay icon. And in addition to representing the small but mighty Florence, it probably is also a representation 
of the thriving queer community in Florence at the time. So something extraordinary happened during the Renaissance. This is the period when most of the most famous classical statues from the Greek and Roman period were discovered, were unearthed. And um, this caused a huge stir. First, uh, the rich patrons uh, during the Renaissance era who wanted to distinguish themselves from the plebeians, they turned to the classic ideals represented by these statues. And if you add to this the fact that um, many of the Renaissance artists, including sculptures, were queer. This explains the explosion of homoerotic sculptures during the Renaissance, using these discovered statues as the reference and as an excuse. And I want to talk to you about the Apollo Belvedere, which is for many the highest, uh, it epitomizes the highest aesthetic ideals of art among all the works of antiquity. Um, it was discovered around 1489. And what are these classical ideals? So let, let, let me walk you through them. He had ideal proportions. He is nude, but this has nothing to do with immorality and vice. Nudity symbolizes the best qualities of mankind, honor and virtue. And he is androgynous. Again, not connected at all with uh, any queerness, but connected to Plato's ideal the original state of unity and oneness. And something that is fascinating, when these statues were created in Greece and Rome, et cetera, they were all, or most of them, fully in color. The, you know, the eyes, the skin, the clothes were all in color. But after being buried for, I don't know, 12 to 13 centuries, when they were uncovered in the Renaissance, the Renaissance artists means construed that they were white, and this became the canon of beauty, starting a culturally loaded concept that really permeates in Western culture until today. And the last element of this idealization is this idea of the small penis. The ideal Greek man can have lots of sex but this was unrelated to the size of his penis. So the Greeks associated a small penis with moderation and rationality, which were the key virtues in masculinity, in heroes, gods, athletes, etc. And the idea of erect penises or large penises was only used for creatures that were undesirable, for instance, the satires, who were last fall or drunkards, et cetera. So another statue or sculpture that caused a huge stir when it was discovered is this statue from the second century BC by Apollonius, which was discovered in the 14, 1430s, the Belvedere Torso. So the Pope asked Michelangelo to finish, to complete the statue, to add a head, the arms, the legs, and Michelangelo refused because he said this statue was too beautiful to alter. But in any case, this statue was the key, a key reference in Michelangelo's work from his statues like the slaves to his religious uh, images, which I'm gonna share with you in a few minutes. Another statue that, uh, that was a big revelation was the Barbary Nifon that was discovered in the 1620s. And from the moment it appeared, queer artists use it as a reference, as an excuse to paint homoerotic male news, including these two and this famous drawing by John Singer Sargent. So if anybody questioned the artist about the possible homoeroticism in the work, the response was, oh, no, 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 I'm just using the Barberini form pose. So that's how the conceit worked. Another statue was the dying Gaul that was discovered in the early 17th century. And here we see a painting by the amazing artist Jacques-Louis David of Patroclus, in which we see that he's basically replicating the back of the dying Gaul as an excuse to portray a beautifully homoerotic image. 
So now that we know how important this classical canon is, from the Renaissance on, the academic studies of the idealized male body become key to an artist's training. However, allowing female artists to classes uh, in which they had new male models was considered immoral. And this kept women away from academic training until the very end of the 19th century. And that's why I'm not showing any female artists in today's lecture. What is very interesting is that many queer artists express their homoerotic desires in these studies. I can show you thousands of examples. These are just three random images of these um, academic studies. And these studies were so abundant that even when they feature what I believe are clearly homoerotic couples, like this, like this uh, of male news, like these three, no one dares to question the artist's intentions. It's always, oh no, no, this is just an academic study. So that's the cover up for the homoeroticism. So, like I said, the classical is the key cover up. So, artists create work based on classical characters, classical poses, or classical books just to, uh, to justify homoerotic uh, images. So, if the story has a message such as honor, strength in battle, and sacrifice, all that is a perfect excuse to portray nudity. For instance, Plato describes Alcibiades as Socrates' beloved. So with that story, thousands of uh, artists, probably most of them queer, use this relationship to portray a homoerotic image. And from now on, I'm gonna be showing you many different topics um, like this. And each topic could have its own presentation. There are so many images that I can show you, but of course I can do that. And today I'm just gonna show you some important images for each of the topics. So there is an illustrator, American illustrator, one of the most famous ones, who I'm gonna talk about in depth next week, J.C. Leindecker. And what is fascinating about him is that he uh, created illustrations and many of which went on the covers of Saturday Evening Post and Colliers, like uh, these three. And he got away with the most astonishing homoerotic images under the alibi that they were classical images. And like I say, next week I'm gonna tell you his story, which is really fascinating. Another allegory or cover up is this idea of archers. Why is that? Because arrows were used in many cases as metaphors for the darts of desire. So here we see a beautiful painting by William Eddy with an archer. And then this is a famous drawing by Michelangelo of archers in which we see Cupid asleep, unable to guide a group of buff naked archers who are throwing invisible arrows to a male erotic icon. So Michelangelo is using the excuse of archers to portray a homoerotic image. And as you're going to see in my three lectures, Michelangelo used every trick in the book to cover up the homoeroticism in his work. Another uh, very commonly used alibi is the idea of athletes. In ancient Greece, as you can see here, um, athletes uh, play sports in the nude. And an athlete's victory was considered semi-divine. So with this classical revival after the Renaissance, there's a direct link between nudity, body and spirit strength, and virility. So many queer artists take advantage of this and use this alibi of showing athletes to express their homoeroticism. This is just an example of a, a painting and here a photography, a modern photography by Bob Meiser, because it, this lasts until really until modern times. And what I would define as the apotheosis of homoerotic sports monuments is this um, complex in Rome called Foro Mussolini, also known as Foro Italico or uh, Stadio de Marmi. Um, it was completed in Rome in 1932, 10 years after the rise to power of uh, Mussolini. Mussolini built it because he wanted to put himself along 
the greatest builders in uh, Italy's history, the Emperor Trajan and Augustus, etc. So if you go visit in person, like I did, and it's really an amazing experience, you'll see how it features 60 towering 12 feet tall naked statues representing all forms of male sporting activity. What I couldn't but laugh uh, when I was there, when I thought that uh, these clearly homoerotic images were created by Mussolini to represent the assumed moral superiority of the fascist youth. And there are murals in public spaces from banks to post offices to courthouses showing male nudity all over the world with the excuse that they are classical images. For instance, this is in Italy. This is in the Clark Hall in Virginia. Again, you see cavorting male nudes, but it's okay because they're classical images. So now I'm gonna take you to a really a watershed moment in history. In 1885, the British law called the Labouchere Amendment introduced a crime of gross indecency, expanding the prosecution of gay men. 10 years later, uh, the Oscar Wilde trials gave birth to the modern homosexual identity. And I'm gonna tell you about that. So in these trials, Oscar Wilde was, used, was uh, asked to defend the law that dared not speak its name which is how we define homosexuality. And to defend it, he invoked classical and religious motifs, like he talked about Plato, the friendship between David and Jonathan in the Bible, and the classical sonnets of Michelangelo and Shakespeare. And he called it the noblest form of affection. So unfortunately, this defense didn't work. While was prosecuted, he was sent to jail. And after the scandal, heterosexuality became the norm and modern homosexuality identity emerged. So what up until now was considered something you do is now who you are, a homosexual, an identity. This also created the stereotype of the artist as a homosexual. So because of this repression, the artist, particularly the queer artist inclination to turn to a classical past as a cover up to show homoerotic male nudes exploded. And I'm gonna show you many examples of this. So let's start with this painting by the Belgian artist, Jean Delville. So Delville used all kinds of classical motifs in this painting, trying to cover up for its homoeroticism. First, he called it Plato's school already, a, a classical reference, although it really could be Jesus and the disciples. And he surrounded him with 12 beautiful, young, androgynous men, one of which is posing like the dying gold statue I shared with you a few minutes ago, another one with the Belvedere torso. So these are all classical elements he used trying to disguise the homoeroticism. So when somebody asked Delville about this male nudity, his response was, it is by the nude alone that the artist can express the essential character of life, the universal beliefs of humanity, and the true meaning of nature. So however, in spite of all these excuses and cover-ups, it really didn't work either. The Belgian government refused to purchase the painting. And in the recent exhibition, this painting was described as a del, uh, deliriously homoerotic composition, basically calling a spade a spade. So in the 19th century, um, the belief was that modern society weakened body and mind. So men took to the Arcadian idea of nature to strengthen their masculinity. So queer artists took advantage of this and they used this romantic notion of love in the hills away from the harsh morals of civilization, creating an idyllic homoerotic present based on an idealized past. So these are three of the, again, hundreds of examples I could show you. 
one by Scott Tube, by, by Flandran, and another one by Thomas Eakins, and the three areas I'm going to be covering in my lectures. It's really fascinating how the first openly gay artists were photographer, photographers. So Baron von Gloden was the first great photographer of the male nude at a time when the female nude was being uh, worshipped. So he's from Germany. He moves to Italy for health reasons. And, uh, he actually goes to Sicily, to Taormina. And there in Taormina, he starts a, a business of photographs in which he uh, showcases local young nude males modeling in classical poses that allows him to get away with these clearly homoerotic images. And this becomes a sensation. Um, and he, his clients are a network of aristocrats, kings, clergy, celebrities, many of which come to visit, like Oscar Wilde, Eleonora Duse, Alexander Graham Bell. And in a story that I find extremely moving, uh, when he uh, died, he bequeathed his over 3,000 negatives to his assistant and partner, Il Moro. And five years after he died, Mussolini raided von Gloden's studio, claiming that his work was pornographic. So Il Moro fought Mussolini in court and won. And it was established that von Gloden's work was art, not pornography, in a landmark case that changed mainstream culture. So, the fact that there's a lack of openly queer images forces queer artists to influence and to copy each other. This is a, a very famous image by the supposedly heterosexual artist Flandran called Young Man by the Sea. And the minute this um, painting uh, uh, is exhibited, it spreads like wildfire, like wildfire to the gay market in male order reproductions. Its popularity until today probably comes from the fact of the tension between this classic concept of context and the lack of context, which allows the viewer to project its own meanings time and time again. This is the reason why it's being copied, reproduced, and spoofed thousands of times, including by photographers like Holland Day and von Gloden, who I just talked about a minute ago, and it's interesting how von Gloden calls this image Cain, probably alluding to the fact of a young man, a gay man, who is being expelled uh, from his family and friends for being uh, homosexual. And this idea of classical image to uh, portray homoerotic uh, visuals exists today, even now when you don't really need that excuse, but they do it because they like it, for instance, Kehinde de Wiley, whom you may be familiar because he did the official portrait of Barack Obama, he creates homoerotic African-American gods in classical poses. And David Liguer is famous for his classic, classical um, images. And he did many of them, he created many of them during the AIDS era, uh, which adds another layer of resonance and meaning, like this particular painting of Achilles and the body of Patroclus. So that's it for classical images. Now let's talk about mythological images. So the Greek gods have always been popular because they open a window into the timeless desires of us humans. In fact, these gods were created in men's image, not the other way around. So while Christianity, you know, uh, covered their body because it was sinful, these Greek gods flaunted their beauty and their nudity very proudly. So from A to Z, from Apollo to Zeus, these mythological gods have been used by artists to express their homoerotic desires until the pretense that their nudity takes place in fantasy. So young gods of immense beauty are an obvious choice for queer artists to bring to life. So Adonis, who was the god of beauty and desire, and Endymion, 
And David was a shepherd, the son of Zeus, and he had a legendary view. The goddess of the moon, which she is, fell in love with him and asked Zeus to give Endymion eternal youth. Zeus agreed. However, he also gave Endymion eternal sleep. So this image of Endymion with him asleep is a perfect image to allow a passive homoerotic gaze. That's why Endymion has been used by thousands of artists throughout history to portray a homoerotic image. And there are so many representations of Narcissus that he deserves its own uh, slide. Narcissus was a young man whose beauty was so powerful that men and women fell under his spell, yet he rejected all their advances and eventually he fell in love with his own reflection. And he stared at it the remainder of his life, desperate for his beloved to materialize. And this is where the word narcissism comes from. So it's no surprise that with uh, his youthful beauty, with this idea of emotional turmoil and the same sex desire, he is a perfect metaphor to show a male nude that can be looked at without offense. So from now on, when you see two names of gods, the first one is the Greek and the second one is the Roman. So Dionysus for the Greek and Bacchus for the Roman was the god of fertility and wine. And Bacchus, I'm sorry, and Eros or Cupid was the god of sexual attraction. So Cupid was depicted variously as either a beautiful youth or as a mischievous nude boy. And I'm showing you two of the most famous examples of Cupid, one by, by Parmigiano and one by Caravaggio, who I'm gonna talk about next week. And both images are so provocative that the owners had to keep them at their house behind a curtain. And three, also three very well-known gods, Orpheus, was the best musician and poet of all the gods. When his wife Eurydice uh, died, he turned to men. Then the god Prometheus was punished for giving fire to humans. And the punishment was that he was bound to a rock and an eagle was sent day after day to eat his liver. Then the liver grew back and then the whole process started again. And then last but not least, Poseidon or Neptune is the violent god of the sea. So nothing in their story talks about their physicality. However, of course, I would just say, queer artists, when they portray these three gods, they always showcase them with astonishing physiques. And Botticelli turned uh, the god Hermes or Mercury into a homoerotic icon in his famous painting, Spring. Like Camille Paglia says, in Botticelli's spring, Mercury ignores the three graces in superb indifference, plucking his own fruit of his own kind. And speaking of Botticelli, um, he was accused of sodomy. And when a friend suggested that he got married to stop the rumors, Botticelli, the thought gave Botticelli such nightmares that it made him run into the night screaming into the streets uh, several times. This is a funny but true story about Botticelli. So Hercules, as you can imagine, is one of the most popular and iconic figures in uh, mythology, you know, with his superhuman strength and uh, he was the epitome of bravery and masculinity. So this is one of the most famous representations of Hercules, the Farnese Hercules, and um, is in the Naples Archaeological Museum in Italy. And if you have the chance to go, please go see this museum, which is extraordinary. And, and this statue, which is, I don't know how big it is, but it really uh, blows your mind. And this statue is so powerful and so emblematic that 
Eugene Sandel, who is a man that was considered the father of modern bodybuilding, started or launched a business of physique photography with poses inspired by the Farnese Hercules in the uh, early 1900s. So his business, oh, he, he had a physical regime and he claimed that following this regime, you could get a body with the exact proportions of the Greek ideal. And this idea of the this photograph of the um, of the male um, knee created an uh, interest that reverberate until today. For instance, with this uh, photograph of uh, Greg Luganis by Herb Ritz. So Hercules is the protagonist of hundreds of myths. Um, this one is about his combat with Anteus, a giant of Lydia who compelled all visitors to wrestle with him. And there are so many examples of uh, artworks featuring this very or clearly homoerotic battle from all angles that you really can recreate it in 360 degrees. That's how popular this uh, homoerotic battle is in art. So in some cases, mythological relationships, which on paper don't have any homoerotic element, get homoerotized by queer artists. For instance, the story of Daedalus and Icarus. So Daedalus was a craftsman who was um, imprisoned in a tower and to escape, he built or created wings for himself and for his son Icarus to escape. He warned his son Icarus not to fly too close to the sun, but we know how that ended. But I'm gonna show you a, a very good example of how this myth has been used to create a homoerotic image by a queer artist, Lord Leighton. In his painting, you see Daedalus kind of stepping aside to show the beauty of his son Icarus. His son who is posing like, you got it, the Apollo Belvedere, a classical element, like the classical setting in Greece and the classical sculpture uh, um, column, Greek. And not only that, this idea of the old and the young man echoes what I told you about these pederasty relationships from ancient Greece between older and younger men. So he basically put every classical uh, element he could in his painting to cover up his homoeroticism. But it didn't work. When the painting debuted at the uh, museum, the London Times Review said that Icarus had the air of a maiden. And in classical mythology, male lovers is a very common, uh, it's a very common situation. Why? Because they were created, these gods and these relationships were created by humans to validate their same-sex relationships. So we all know about Achilles, who was immortal. The only exception was that made him vulnerable, was his heel, which proved to be fatal because that's where he got an, an arrow and he died. So Although Homer, the, the famous author, did not portray Achilles and Patroclus as lovers in his book, The Iliad, Plato described Achilles sacrificing himself for his lover, Patroclus. He also talked about um, Achilles' close relationship with his mentor, Chiron. So these stories have been used as a perfect excuse by artists throughout history to portray homoerotic images. So now we are with Apollo, who is one of the most popular gods, the Olympian god of light and order. Apollo was loved by men, women, human gods, and he loved them back. So these are three examples of uh, paintings featuring um, Apollo. Here is Apollo and Diana. And you would wonder, what is Diana? She's basically an afterthought. She's just an, this is an excuse to portray a clearly homoerotic image. And the most famous of uh, the male affairs of Apollo are two that didn't end well with his lovers being transformed into plants. So let's start with Apollo and Siparisus. 
Cyparsus was Apollo's young lover. And when Cyparsus lost the pet deer that Apollo gave him as a gift, Apollo transformed Cyparsus into a cypress tree to let him be sorrowful forever. And the story of Apollo's favorite um, hyacinth is even sadder. When Apollo and Hyacinth were play, uh, practicing disc throwing, um, jealous God made the disc swerve back, this is the disc, and kill Hyacinth. So Apollo was so devastated that from a drop of blood from Hyacinth, he created a flower which bears his lover's name until today, the Hyacinth. But the relationship that really, really transformed as history in regards to Greek mythology is the relationship between Zeus or Jupiter and Gaia. So in Greek mythology, Zeus, the, the god, the, the king of the ruler of the Olympus, is in love with Ganymede, an exceedingly handsome, aristocratic, young Trojan, a human. So Zeus becomes an eagle, and he comes to uh, Earth, and he abducts Ganymede to, Ma to Mount Olympus, where Ganymede is rewarded with immortality. So this myth, the only reason this myth exists is to justify the desire between an older man and a younger man. However, the Greeks, attempting to reconcile the pagan tradition and the Christian values, they tried to justify Ganymede by saying, oh, it's actually a metaphor of the ascent of the soul rejoicing in God, or it's about platonic love free from physical bonds. No, that's, it is what it is. You know, an artist knew that and created allegorical interpretation of these erotic elements, including this very graphic painting by Rubens, who was not even, as we know, uh, or as we believe, uh, queer. But let's see how somebody very important uses Ganymede, Michelangelo. So Michelangelo met the nobleman Tommaso de Cavalieri when Michelangelo was around 58 and Tommaso around 17. Tommaso was a man of immense beauty and intelligence, and Michelangelo fell in love with him immediately, and they started a relationship. We don't know the exact nature of the relationship because by all accounts, Tommaso was heterosexual. But the fact that Michelangelo defends his chastity constantly in his autobiography, it proves that his feelings for Tommaso violated social norms. In any case, the relationship lasted 30 years until Michelangelo died. In fact, Michelangelo died holding Tommaso's hand. So Michelangelo created a series of what is called now presentation drawing for his closest friend, including Tommaso. These presentation drawings were so extraordinary that up until then, drawings were considered secondary sketches. And after these drawings, they became an independent form of art. One of the most famous ones is this drawing of Ganymede that Michelangelo sent to Tommaso just a few days after they met. So why does Michelangelo use Ganymede? Because by using Ganymede, Michelangelo is implying that their relationship is emulating the mentorship relationships between older and younger men from the Greek times. Michelangelo was very religious. So this Ganymede allowed him to conceal, to hide, an explicit expression of desire at a time in history when sodomy was punishable by prison. What is really fascinating is that Michelangelo's Ganymede turns upside down the previous images of Ganymede. In his version, Ganymede is not a passive victim, but a willing participant in the abduction. And the image even opens the door to erotic interpretation. But not only that, Michelangelo wrote poems and sonnets to Tommaso. For instance, I'm a slave, prisoner of love. My wicked senses have deprived my heart of peace. If to be happy, I must be conquered and chained, it is no wonder that naked and alone, I remain prisoner of an armed cavalier. I really like the word he plays with the idea of cavalier and cavalieri the last name of his uh, beloved. And these sonnets are considered the first substantial body of verses in modern language of one man addressed to another. 
What is extraordinarily sad is that when Michelangelo's nephew first published his sonnets in 1623, he changed the pronouns as if these sonnets were addressed to a female lover. So this is one of the many examples throughout history of uh, families trying to hide the sexuality, the homosexuality of an artist. And this secret was not discovered until at least 300 years later. So for 300 years, everybody thought that Michelangelo's poems were addressed to a woman. One of the most important artists of the Renaissance period is Cellini. His cultures are fundamentally homoerotic. He chooses mythological uh, visuals as an excuse. And when he sculpted this gun in it, he declared in public that he had used pieces of a Roman sculpture to so he could kind of add an extra classical cover up to it. Cellini was tried for sodomy three times and he spent four years in prison. And when a rival called him a dirty sodomite in the presence of Cosimo de' Medici, Cellini had a response that is really famous to this day. He told uh, his rival, oh fool, you're wrong. I wish I knew how to practice such an noble art since one reads that Zeus used it with Ganymede in paradise. And here on earth, the greatest emperors use it. I am a humble wretch, and neither could I, nor would I know how to get involved in such an admirable thing. So with this answer, he basically sashayed away and put his rival in place. Okay, that's it for mythological. And now we are in the last section of the presentation, which is religious images used to legitimize homoerotic cases in all arts and eras. So in, Christi in Christianity, nudity was only is sinful and it was only acceptable as a subject of tragedy of works inspired by the Bible. If the images were too beautiful and they excited the viewer, it could be easily and conveniently interpreted as religious fervor, with some exceptions. For instance, this drawing by, of San Sebastian by Bandinelli was so provocative that it had to be hidden by the priest because they, it awakened the sexual desires in the congregation. And I'm gonna show you how Adam, Cain and Abel, saints, and many religious characters have been portrayed in very provocative poses, such as this of the death of Abel, which go unquestioned because of the sacred subject matter. And a key example of the religious cover-up to justify homoerotic homo uh, images is Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. So tormented by his same-sex desire, Michelangelo accepts the commission to do the Sistine Chapel with the intention of saving his soul. But he was unable to repress his passion for the male nude, which exploded in sensual provocative uh, images. And as I mentioned before, the Belvedere torso gave him an extra layer of cover-up to portray homoerotic images like the Adam or the Inuri in the Sistine Chapel. And Michelangelo's revolutionary images have influ influenced queer artists ever since. So the artists have used the, if Michelangelo, Michelangelo used them, so can I, alibi for centuries. But as Michelangelo's career developed, the Catholic Church crackdown on lasciviousness intensified. So when the Last Judgment was unveiled, the Pope's Master of Ceremonies declared that Michelangelo's murals were more suitable for a, bro for a brothel than for a chapel. And many of the news in the Last Judgment were covered with garments and loincloths. And they still remain to this day, in spite of the recent restoration of the uh, Sistine Chapel, because the originals have been destroyed. And a very prominent man of the time, Pietro Aretino, accused Michelangelo of being godless and homosexual. So in revenge, Michelangelo portrayed him like an old man, stern, and with a flayed skin, in which he's holding a flayed skin, and with a portrait 
that has been interpreted as being Michelangelo's anguished, distorted self-portrait. So all of these criticisms launched what is called the fig leaf campaign, which kind of crystallized with the Council of Trent in 15, uh, 1563, which bans all lasciviousness in art. And in fact, this is one of history's most significant acts of, of censorship. So inspired by the early images of Adam and Eve wearing leaves, nude sculptures across Italy soon started sporting carefully played fig sleeves shielding the genitals. And Michelangelo was already familiar with this. When his famous uh, David unveiled in uh, Florence in uh, 1504, he scandalized many people. So soon after, his genitals were covered uh, with a marble fig leaf, which was in place until 1912. And then he created this naked uh, Christ called the Redeemer in 1519, that when unveiled was so shocking that years later, somebody with an ass ax destroyed uh, the genitals. And since then, it's been displayed with a loincloth. So angels, up until the Renaissance, were considered secondary characters, uh, neither male nor female. So they are a perfect excuse to portray androgyny. And this is what Botticelli did in many of his paintings, including this one, the Madonna, the Magnificat, in which we can see the angels of ambiguous sexuality more interested in each other than in the Madonna. And this is expressing Botticelli's own feelings and desires using the angels as an excuse. These are two other images of homoerotic uh, angels. You know, we all know about Adam and Eve, but if you take Eve out of the equation, we're left with Adam. And that's a perfect excuse for what you can call the original homoerotic sin. And these are three of the many examples of it throughout history. And even Christ has been used with daring images to legitimize a homoerotic gaze. For instance, this one by Il Sodoma, the artist who adopted this name because he embraced his homosexuality openly at this time. Or this image by Rosso Fiorentino. Or thousands of images of the flagellation, like this one from 1515, which when you see it in person like it did, it really has kind of a uh, sadomasochistic tone to it, okay? So, so that's another uh, way to uh, cover up homoeroticism. So Saint, Saint John, the young apostle, who had a very close relationship with Jesus, and Saint John the Baptist have been portrayed in art in thousands of homoerotic images as Catholic pinups. This is the version of Leonardo da Vinci. And you know, he shows St. John the Baptist like a sultry adolescent. And probably the model for it was Leonardo's um, assistant and most probably lover, Salai, which means little devil. But let's now talk to the star of this topic with St. Sebastian. So the real St. Sebastian was a middle-aged soldier who was accused of converting Romans to Christianity. So because of that, he was uh, tied to a tree and shot with arrows, but he did not die from this. He was rescued by Saint Irene, and soon after, when he was recovered, he was clapped to death and thrown into the sewers. So how come the images we are so familiar with of Saint Sebastian are so different from this story? And how did he become a homoerotic icon? Well, I'm gonna tell you the story. So in the year 1348, half of Europe had been decimated by the plague. So people started to pray to the saint who survived those arrows, Saint Sebastian. And when the epidemic ended, he became the most popular saint in Christendom. So during centuries of Christianity's repression, 
thousands of images of this sexually ambiguous nude male with arrows on his body covered by a narrow loincloth were the only accepted ways for artists to express their homoerotic desire, making him the most frequently portrayed male saint in art history. And when Renaissance comes and Renaissance artists immediately forget his image as a middle-aged man, they start ignoring the arrows and they turn him into a handsome, young, naked man with proportions from the ancient Greece canons in poses that combine pleasure and pain or even just pleasure, like this one uh, of Garofalo. So once the arrows disappear, he becomes a blank canvas in which everyone projects their own story, contributing to his popularity to this day. So naked, tortured, sexually ambiguous, he's a perfect metaphor for the public martyrdom of the gay community. For instance, during the AIDS era, that's why he became a gay icon and in a way the patron saint of homosexuality. And he has been an inspiration for queer writers, painters, photographers, for instance, Oscar Wilde, after he left jail, prison, he adopted the name Sebastian because he felt that he was like him, a gay martyr. The famous painter Guido Reni painted at least seven very iconic versions of Saint Sebastian. And the famous writer Yukio Mishima declared that uh, stumbling upon uh, the paintings of Guido Reni in his father's art books marked the beginning of his sexual self-discovery. And he created a series of photos inspired by the iconic Guido Reni painting. And these are just some of the examples of photographs uh, using Saint Sebastian uh, as an excuse for homoeroticism. And there are many stories in the Bible which on paper don't have a homoerotic reading at all. However, artists, mostly probably queer, portray them with a clear homoerotic spin, like this one of the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son, or the sacrifice of Isaac. And one of the most popular ones is Cain and Abel, which has been portrayed from a homoerotic expression of the murder to a sexualized portrayal of the death of Abel in which he can be the passive object of a homoerotic case, like Endymion was in the mythological section of the presentation. Even hell is not excused from homoeroticism. This is the famous uh, murals of Luca Signorelli in the Orvieto Cathedral in Italy. And before these frescoes, the nude, as I mentioned before, was a shameful sight. However, Signorelli depicts nudity in Nosa not as something damn or diabolic. In fact, he portrays mostly young, attractive men, and he's a huge influence on Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel. And the last image is this kind of delirious image of hell called the Fall of the Titans, in which the artist, for reasons that I don't think anybody is able to interpret, he portrays a cluster of male nudes with the nudity covered by butterflies or a dragonfly. So just to close my talk, at the beginning, I mentioned how the art world try, tries to dismiss the importance of homosexuality in art history. So I really hope that my lecture today helped change this perception, even if it's just a little bit. And I leave you with these words by one of my favorite artists, Keith Haring. He says, my life is dominated by my sexuality, the driving force behind my work. I'm glad I'm different, proud to be a part of a brotherhood of gay artists written out of history by an uninformed, conservative, homophobic public. So I leave you with these very strong words. Um, thank you so much for your attention. And now it's time if you have any questions. I want to say first and foremost, um, thank you, Ignacio, for that incredible lecture. Um, very thorough, really fascinating, um, and uh, really comprehensive. So I just want to say thank you so much for the, thank you, Michael. It's a really great food for thought. Um, and definitely want to open it up to folks. If anybody has any questions or comments, reactions, 
uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and jump on in. Quick question. Yes. Um, I was wondering why uh, with the such obvious connection between Ganymede and Zeus, why um, didn't even uh, let's say Renaissance artists glom on it so much more intensely? Um, is it too obvious that you know the connection would have been uh, would have been used to prosecute them? Not yeah. sure. Exactly, because like even Michelangelo, you know, uh, uh, anything that was open, declaration of homosexuality was punishable with prison. So they had to cover it up as much as they could. You know what I'm saying? So just like you just said, yes, they had to do it in a way that didn't necessarily tell everything, but it was enough to be understood by those in the know without causing the law to, to infringe on them. That, that's really what you just said. Okay. Thank you. Thank Anybody else? Questions? Thoughts? Uh, yeah. Uh, have you heard the uh, idea that the Mona Lisa is actually uh, a portrait of a man? Absolutely. In fact, I, I talked about that in one of my uh, two upcoming talks. And one of the many theories is that the portrait, the model was uh, Leonardo's assistant, Salai, who is the one that I just showed you the painting that he did, uh, uh, St. John the Baptist. In fact, uh, Leonardo gave the Mona Lisa to Salai in his will. Mm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Um, have you, uh, are you familiar with Robert Rauschenberg's uh, canon? You are gonna, I'm gonna talk about that in big depth <laughs> in my third lecture. Okay. Great presentation. Thank you, Brian. Wonderful. Anybody Hi, else? Marco. Hi. Hi, Liana. Hi, how are you? Good. That was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to know how, what your thoughts are. I feel like so much of the reckoning that's been going on in the general art world these days, um, how is it going to be continued to be taught and explored in the educational system and in particularly you know at the college level i feel like so much of this what you're discussing um is lost i mean i went through art school a long time ago mind you but how do we see it going from this point going forward do you think so that well, this can all this is be a, a amazing, amazing question Juliana. so let's talk about first about the the whole concept of homosexuality in art. It's interesting that you ask that because I feel that it's changing as we speak. And by that, I mean October, 2021. Let me give you an example. Um, I went to a retrospective of uh, Rosenberg at the MoMA Museum in New York, uh, I don't know, four years ago, whatever that was. And I was outraged that he described his relationship with Jasper Jones as they were buddies, they were friends. In no way, it talked about that they were together for eight years or they're impacting each other, et cetera. So I was really outraged by that. Cut to the recent uh, opening of a retrospective of Jasper Jones right now in New York and Philadelphia. And now the articles are finally, for the first time, addressing their relationship. So I think that at this point in history, it could be shocking uh, to, to push this aside. And I'm talking about in the museum world, okay? Now let's go to, to your second part of your question, which is in schools. Your guess is as good as mine. I don't think this is taught in schools at all. That's why I wanna share this with universities because nobody teaches this. It's still excluded from the curriculum. And I believe that if the queer youth sees this, they're gonna understand that they come from a very important heritage in history that is being denied and hidden to them. Exactly. Thank you. Mm. Agreed. Ignacio? Yeah. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I just read recently, I think it was at the Huntington Gardens where they've got the garden with all of the nude statues in it. Yeah. That 
One of the reasons why the penises are so small on the men is because um, animals had, some of them, and much larger penises, and the men considered themselves as humans much more superior to animals. And therefore, it was a superiority, and it was sort of shameful to have larger penises because it was more animalistic. Have you heard that theory? I've heard that, but it's a secondary motif. Uh, it is all about this idea of small penis can keep a mind to be moderate, rational, which is what the classical idea of value was in a hero. You know what I'm saying? So that was really the essence, but it's true what you're saying. Is, but in a way, what you're saying is reinforcing what I just said. It's this idea of the small uh, uh, penis making somebody more human, intellectual, rational, as opposed to animals or satires who had big erect penises. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I heard of another practical aspect of why the penises on statues are rather small is that um, they broke off rather easily if they got yeah. too big. <laughs> I don't know if that's, that's true or true. not. That's true. I mean, who knows? Uh, the story about Michelangelo, the one that uh, the Christ the Redeemer that somebody destroyed it, is such a powerful story. And I've seen the statue and I didn't know that originally it was nude, you know, because now it has the loincloth. So it's, it's interesting because it helps you see. I hope that my, my lecture helped you see art from a different perspective, to see that a lot of the uh, stories that nobody has told us in the past. Anybody else? Okay, so I guess that's it. Well, just wanna say thank you again to Ignacio and to everyone who was able to, to join us today. Um, really looking forward to part two next Thursday at 2 p.m. Uh, so please feel free to join us again if you're able to next week uh, and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>